Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, delighted to welcome you to this sixth biennial uh, ECB conference on fiscal policy and annual governance. Unfortunately, uh, Frank's Metz couldn't make it, so I was right now asked to chair this session. My name is Ettore Dorucci, and I had the fiscal policy division here at ECB. Um, this conference is actually a well-established uh, conference um, for which over the years uh, we have been hosting uh, a very fruitful dialogue between uh, central bankers, academics, policymakers, market participants, and uh, uh, which has promoted uh, new and influential research on fiscal policy uh, and on the reform of MU uh, architecture. Uh, we plan to do the same also in the coming two days. Uh, the organizers, who I would like to, to thank, you can see some of them over there. Jacopo is there, Demos, uh, Leo, uh, and others. Um, uh, so the uh, organizers have really put together, I would say, a very nice uh, program, rich program, which includes eight academic papers, a keynote lecture by Olivier Blanchard this afternoon, which be, will be chaired by our board member, Isabel Schnabel, and in, a dinner speech by Vitor Gaspar, uh, a policy panel that will be chaired by Philippe Lane and will include uh, Silvia Ardagna, uh, Roel Betzma, Valdis Dombrostis, and Jeromin Zettelmaia. Uh, today, uh, we will have um, two sessions of academic papers, uh, respectively uh, one on fiscal policies in monetary unions and the financing of fiscal deficits, and the other one on the design of fiscal rules and uh, fiscal uh, consolidations. Tomorrow, uh, the two sessions will cover macroeconomic effects of fiscal policy and monetary fiscal interactions uh, in a monetary union. Um, before starting with the first paper, let me remind you a few uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, each paper will have 25 minutes for the presentation, 15 minutes for the discussion, and 10 minutes for the general discussion and uh, uh, answer from the speaker. Uh, since the conference has a tight schedule uh, for the discussion and uh, Q&A, we will give priority to the questions from the floor. Um, coffee break will be on the terrace on the third floor, just in front at the end of this uh, corridor. Uh, and uh, uh, on internet, uh, you uh, can find QR codes over there or outside the room. So um, if you want to, to connect, you, you know uh, how to do that. So without further ado, uh, let me now give the floor to Eugenia. Uh, or um, if uh, Ramon hasn't arrived yet, right? Okay, then uh, uh, in this case, <laughs> uh, welcome also to um, uh, Christian uh, Wolf. Um, let me maybe just briefly introduce the two um, presenters. So uh, uh, Christian will, uh, uh, from the MIT, will present a paper on can deficits finance themselves, uh, co-authored with uh, uh, George Marius Angelatos and Chen Lian, um, and the discussant is going to be uh, Davide, Davide De Bortoli from uh, University, uh, University uh, Pompeo Fabra, um, Eugenia from the uh, uh, Gonzalez Aquado from the uh, Toulouse School of Economics will present a paper co authored with uh, Rafael Burial, uh, Patrick Quijoy, and uh, Elena Pastorino. The discussant is going to be uh, Ramon Marimon from the University Pompeo Fabra. So, um, uh, Christian, the floor, the floor is yours. Okay, good. Uh, okay, perfect. Thank, thanks for the invite. Thanks for having me. I'm presenting this paper with Maria Senchen on whether fiscal deficits can finance themselves. Okay, uh, and this, this works. Perfect. Okay, good. So here's the setting of the paper. In a world where R is bigger than G and there's a fiscal deficit right now, say because the fiscal authorities send out transfers to households. The question we're going to be asking is, because with an R bigger than G world, something will need to give to finance that initial deficit. How is it going to happen? So this is a, this is a theory paper. And does it? No? Yes. Ah. There you go. 
maybe a bit of a lag. Okay, good. Hey, so it's a theory paper. We're going to be answering that question in a in an environment with the following kind of two two key ingredients. So number one, on the private sector non policy side of the model, there's going to be number one non Ricardian households. So that's going to mean if there's an initial deficit because households are non Ricardian, it's going to influence demand. And number two, output is at least going to be partially demand determined because prices are sticky. Okay, good. Then on the policy side, the policy mix is going to be what I'll refer to as conventional in the following sense. Number one, the fiscal authority is going to be Ricardian in the classical sense, meaning there's a deficit today and it does stand ready to hike taxes, just maybe not immediately, but down the line to balance the books. And number two, the monetary authority will not be accommodating that initial deficit. Real rates will not be declining. The Taylor principle will be satisfied. Okay. Now, in that environment, we're going to get at least partial. This is a bit unfortunate. Uh, like, okay. Uh, sorry, guys. Okay. Uh, like, is it going to be like that throughout? That'll be a bit of an issue. But okay, I I, I hope it comes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Good. I'll, I'll try to anticipate and like click in advance. Let's see how. Let's see how that goes. Okay, so what we're going to get is kind of because of these ingredients, what's going to happen is there's a deficit today, demand will go up. That will mean in general equilibrium, because there's a demand boom, output will go up. So the tax base will go up. And as a result of that, even without the fiscal authority doing anything, tax revenue is going to be going up at least a little bit. So that'll contribute to the financing of the initial deficit. Number two, if government debt is nominal and the boom also in, in, induces an increase in prices, inflation, then the real value of government debt is going to be eroded. I'll refer to both of those as self-financing in the sense that both of these kind of lead to financing of the initial deficit, not via the government actively adjusting something, but via equilibrium responses of prices and quantities. Okay, so far so standard that this is what's going to happen in this environment. Now the, I should have clicked a bit in advance. Okay, good. Well, this was quick. So the kind of the core result of the paper is now going to be that um, kind of what I'm going to be varying is the horizon of the fiscal adjustment, the horizon which the government says I'm going to be hiking taxes to balance the books. And the core result is going to be that number one, as you delay the horizon of financing more and more, these two self-financing margins, output going up, so tax revenue going up, and prices going up, so the real value of government debt being eroded, will become more and more important. And you're going to be limiting to the case of full self-financing. So as I, as the government, delay my adjustment more and more, endogenously prices and quantities will respond in exactly the right way to fully finance the initial deficit. Okay, And the strength of nominal rigidities will just be governing the split between the two. If prices are fully rigid, it all comes via the output tax base expansion. The more flexible prices are, the more important the initial spike in inflation is going to be. Okay, good. So that's the outline of the talk. Um, Environment, core result, intuition, and then a bit of quantification at the end. Good. So let me let me jump right in. Unless there are any questions, then feel free to interrupt me. Okay, good. Uh, so here's the environment um, in a second. Okay. Let me already sketch the environment because it's kind of it's gonna be relatively vanilla as I've kind of described it here. Um, it's going to be essentially like a small scale kind of standard New Keynesian, New Keynesian environment, particularly on the supply side and on the policy side. The key twist is going to be on the household side, how I'm going to make households Ricardian and how that is going to lead to kind of these demand effects initially uh, kicking off and how that's going to be interacting with the horizon of, of fiscal adjustment. Okay, so uh, two blocks, non-policy block and policy block. Let me begin with the non-policy block and in particular the aggregate demand spending relation. So there's going to be a unit continuum of um, overlapping generations of households. That's going to be my kind of my reduced form stand in for non Ricardian non Ricardianness with a period to period survival probability of Omega. It's between zero and one. If Omega was equal to one, these guys are just infinitely live. This would be the usual representative agent, permanent income, Ricardian consumption, consumption savings block. I'm going to be looking at Omega less than one. And you can in reduced form here interpret one minus Omega as the probability of, buy, of uh, borrowing constraints binding from period to period. It's just going to effectively shorten the planning, the spending horizon of households. These guys are going to be uh, investing as usual in actually fair annuities. So I'm going to have that the discount factor is beta, beta times one plus R bar, the steady state real rate of interest is one. So R bar is bigger than zero. So something will need to give to finance any initial fiscal deficit. Now, out of this consumption savings problem, 
of my overlapping generations block of households, I'm going to get the following aggregate consumption relationship. And that relationship, you know, the economics of it are key for anything I'm going to say today. So I want to take my time going through it because that's what's going to be driving my main results. So what we see here is consumption on the left hand side as a function of current household wealth, DT, as well as current and expected future income and tax payments, Y and T. The real interest rate term are on the right hand side. I'm going to return to later on. For now, we can largely ignore this. That's why it's grayed out. Now, let's suppose, first of all, for a second, that omega was equal to one. So we'd have the usual permanent income model. In that case, what's your MPC? Well, your MPC is just if you have money, you, can, uh, you consume the annuity value of that. So it's one minus beta, or equivalently R bar over one plus R bar. So you have some wealth, DT, today. Your MPC would be one minus omega, very small. Now, as omega gets smaller, so we have non-Ricardian households. As we know, the MPC is going to get elevated in a literal sense because these guys expect to die, so they front load their consumption in a less literal sense because they expect borrowing constraints to bind. Okay, good. So that's the first key feature that will make my results tick, the elevated MPC. Then there's this, um, so that's what you kind of see on the left-hand side, the one, uh, first term on the right-hand side, the one minus beta times omega, then out of current wealth, DT. And then we have the income term. So current and future income, YT, less current and future tax payments, TT. Okay, now usually in the permanent income model, we just be discounting that at the steady state real rate of interest. So that's why you have the beta, beta squared, beta cubed, and so on. Now what's the permanent, the, what are the binding borrowing constraints gonna give us? They're gonna give us additional discounting. So we're gonna see that any future stream of income and any future stream of tax payments is gonna be discounted incrementally more. That's why the omega is showing up. Again, the literal interpretation is your consumption today doesn't respond as much to your income tomorrow because you expect perhaps to die. And a less literal interpretation because you run into binding borrowing constraints between today and tomorrow. Okay, good. So these two key features of demand, the elevated MPC and the discounting, are going to be what's driving my core results throughout the entire paper, rather than the literal OLG microfoundation. As, and later, as I'm going to go quantitative and connect to the Hank literature, it'll be those two key features that will continue to drive my results. Just with this stuff here, I can easily prove stuff. Okay, good. So that's the demand block. Now, the rest, uh, kind of the supply side, I can go through relatively quickly if the technology cooperates. Let's see. Um, there you go. So these households supply labor as usual. They're going to be the usual nominal rigidities among the sticky price retailers. Taxes are also for the main part of the talk because it's not going to interfere with my main results. going to be lump sum just to make things very easy. And out of all of that, we're going to get the vanilla textbook um, New Keynesian Phillips curve. We're letting inflation today to output today and expected inflation tomorrow. Okay, so these are my two, my first two relations, the demand block equation one and the supply relationship equation two. Okay, now to complete the environment, let me go through the policy side. Um, so there's, there's a monetary authority, there's a fiscal authority. Okay, good. So there's going to be two sets of relationships that we begin with the monetary authority. The monetary authority will be setting the nominal rate on one period nominally risk-free bonds. I'll denote that nominal rate by IT. And for the main part of the talk, I look at the following simple kind of rule where the nominal rate is set so that the real rate or the expected real rate is equal to phi times output. So phi you can interpret as if it's positive, the monetary authority is leaning against any fiscally induced boom. If it's negative, it's accommodating. For the main part of my talk, I look at, just to make the math very clean and simple, I look at phi equal to zero, so an acyclical real rate. That's what the monetary authority is doing. So no accommodation, but also no particularly aggressive leaning against. I'll relax that at the end. Okay. Now, key part, the fiscal policy, because that's where I'm going to be varying this kind of key parameter, the horizon of fiscal adjustment. So the fiscal authority issues nominal debt BT. In real terms, this is what its budget concern is going to be looking like. Real government debt going into tomorrow is just debt today, DT, less tax revenue, TT, accumulated up at the real rate of interest. If real rates are away from steady state, say if they're higher, then this increases the debt burden. That's the second term you see. And finally, because government debt is one period nominally risk-free, if there's surprise inflation, that will erode the real value of government debt. So we see here, how is any deficit going to be financed? Well, there are two main avenues for me, the blue ones, it's taxes, and it's surprise inflation. Now let's dig a little bit deeper into how taxes are determined, because that's, again, the key thing I'm going to be varying. Uh, okay, there are going to be three terms. Let me begin at the, uh, at the end. Epsilon T, that's kind of the experiment I'm looking at. 
a shock, a lump sum transfer to households. So enters negatively. So surprise taxes are going to be somewhat lower for a period. That's going to be increasing the deficit. That's my experiment, the shock I'm, whose propagation I'm going to be studying. And then there are two additional terms. The middle one is the tax base channel from the introduction. If output goes up, then mechanically, even without the fiscal authority doing anything, tax revenue goes up by some coefficient tau y. So in the data, think of that as like, so the average kind of tax take and transfer response, like 0.3 or something. A dollar of output improves the fiscal balance by 30 cents. Okay, good. Um, and then there's a final term, which is the actual fiscal adjustment, tau d. It's going to be between zero and one. If it's one, then fiscal adjustment is very quick. There's a deficit today. I immediately hike taxes to balance the books. The smaller tau d is going to be, the more delayed fiscal adjustment is going to be, the weaker it is. Okay. And to make it even clearer what I mean by delayed fiscal adjustment, I'll also be looking at the following variant rule, kind of a, a non-Markovian time-dependent generalization of, of the rule equation five that you see here, which should come down there in a second. Uh, there you go. No, come on. Which, okay, there you go. Which just makes this tau d coefficient time-dependent and says there's my initial deficit, my initial shock at date zero. Then for H periods, tau D will be zero. There's no fiscal adjustment whatsoever. And then after H periods, where H is something I'll be varying, tau D is equal to one, which just kind of in English means I have a deficit today. I don't do anything for H periods. And after H periods, I'll tax however much is needed to bring my debt back to steady state. So a very clear example of a Ricardian rule, just a delayed, a delayed adjusted Ricardian rule. Just one quick question. How much time do I still have left? Like um, You still have... Um, um... 40 minutes. 40 minutes. Okay, perfect. Because I didn't quite keep track of when we started. Okay, good. Now, one more slide on the environment, and then I'll get to the to the headline results. So what I've sketched now, equations one to five, under my the assumptions I'll be maintaining throughout that omega is less than one. So households are at least marginally non-Ricardian. And number two, tau y is bigger than positive, uh, bigger than zero. So this tax based channel is operative. This economy I've just described, equations one to five, has a unique bounded equilibrium. That's the equilibrium I'll be studying. And I'll be focusing on one particular property of that equilibrium, one particular object whose properties I want to characterize. Um, there you go. So my question is, how are fiscal deficits, how is this initial shock epsilon, epsilon T, this lump sum transfer shock to households, how is that financed? Okay, I can just look at the governed budget constraint, iterate that thing forward. And what I'm going to see mechanically is, the initial deficit can be financed in one of three ways. The first one, kind of the first term on the right-hand side, is the kind of conventional fiscal adjustment. The government with this tau d term actively responds to a higher deficit to increase taxes to balance the books. Okay. The other two terms are going to be what I'll refer to as self-financing. Number one, in general equilibrium, the initial deficit may be leading to an increase in output that will mechanically increase tax revenue. That's my output self-financing term. And number two, that boom may also lead to inflation, surprise inflation devalues real government debt. So that's the price self-financing term, okay? Now I'll refer to the overall share of these self-financing terms as new. So something that's between zero and one. And I wanna characterize how that share of self-financing, the relative importance of those terms, is gonna be changing as I change the horizon of fiscal adjustment. So as I vary tau d or as I vary h. Okay, so here's now the core theoretical result of the paper. What I'm going to do is I'm going to just, just formally state the result, then give you kind of just communicate the content of the result via a figure, and then we're going to go through the economic intuition of it, what makes the result tick, and then at the end we're going to have the quantification. Okay. Good. So same assumptions as before, omega less than one, uh, omega less than one, and tau y is strictly positive. Then the self-financing share new has the following two main properties. Number one is monotonicity. It is increasing in the delay of fiscal adjustment. So as I lower tau d or as I increase h, the importance of these two self-financing channels, price and quantities, is going to be increasing. Okay. So more comes via those relative to the actual on equilibrium fiscal adjustment that government initially promised to do. Number two is a limit result. As I increase the horizon of fiscal adjustment more and more, in the sense of I increase h or I lower tau d new is going to be converging to one okay so all financing turns out to be along the equilibrium transition path self-financing so say h is reasonably large the government said i would stand ready to balance the books h periods from now but on equilibrium it doesn't turn out to be necessary 
turns out to be the case that the boom the initial deficit induced is of exactly the size required to finance that initial deficit. Okay. And just two more little properties of this. Um, so number one is, so along this equilibrium transition path, government debt will just on its own gradually return back to steady state. And number two, nominal rigidities then just govern the split between quiet prices and quantities. And in particular, the more rigid prices are, the more it comes via output. And that just mechanically means if prices are fully rigid, the cumulative output multiplier needs to be one over the tax rate, just as a matter of arithmetic, right? Good. Um, fortunately, it's... Okay, now it's coming in. Okay. See, if I had known this, I wouldn't have put in so many pauses in the slides. This is kind of unfortunate. Uh, I'm already dreading the next slide, which has like many things popping in and out. Oh, well. Uh, okay. Trying to move ahead. See? Um, I don't know. Am I supposed, like, does it help if I point this somewhere? Uh, no. Is, no, no, it doesn't. Okay, good. <laughs> fine, fine. Okay, good. All right, so what I'm showing you is a visual representation of the results. So left and middle panel are going to be impulse responses of output and government debt to this initial fiscal deficit chalk epsilon zero under different assumptions on the fiscal adjustment horizon H. Okay, that's what the left and middle panels show us. The right panel will show us this self-financing share new, and it's split into prices and quantities as a function of the adjustment horizon H on the x-axis. To give you a quick preview for this slide, like just to contextualize it right, this is supposed to just visually illustrate the contents of the result. Don't take them the magnitudes at this point seriously, neither speed of convergence nor split between prices and quantities. Okay, now what I'm doing here, and these are the things that will kind of gradually pop in, which is the decision I'm now regretting, is I'm increasing H, okay? I'm increasing the horizon at which I'm doing the fiscal adjustment. So what do you see here as I'm increasing H? So the first lines where H is equal to zero, which is immediate fiscal adjustment, which is kind of schizophrenic. I give you money today, I tax you immediately. Of course, nothing happens and the self-financing share is zero. As I increase H, I'm gonna get a transitory boom. That's what you see here. So government debt is then elevated up until date H and then by definition of my rule goes back to zero. So to steady state at date H. Okay. Now what happens as I increase H? You see as things ideally slowly pop in, you see a more and more persistent output boom on the left-hand side. In the middle, you see government debt on its own gradually going back to steady state. And on the right-hand side, you see as I'm increasing age, this importance of self-financing, this uh, scalar new is going to be increasing and it's gonna be converging to one, okay? So kind of just the message here is that as the government commits to doing the adjustment later and later, Instead, already the adjustment will be happening along the equilibrium transition path through prices and quantities adjusting. Okay, good. So that's the core content of the result illustrated visually. Um, so I think supposed to be one more thing popping in. Um, there you go. That's what I just said. Okay, it comes via prices and quantities. Good. So now I want to communicate the core economics, the economic intuition for the result. That's kind of the key thing I want to communicate. And then if we still have some time left, I'll do a little bit quantitative stuff, theoretical extensions and so on. Okay, so here's what makes the result tick and why non-Ricardian household behavior interacts with delays in fiscal adjustment in that particular way. Okay, so let me start by already pulling in a bunch of things in advance. Okay, so I want to communicate the intuition. As it turns out, this kind of infinite horizon model I just sketched has very precise and formal analogs in a kind of dinky seeming, excessively simplistic, two period, essentially static Keynesian cross model, okay, that allows for our tax based channel. So here's what happens in this kind of Mickey Mouse model. And then I'll try to convince you this has analogies in our full environment. So consider two period Keynesian cross model, where in period zero, the government gives money to households and says, I'll tax you at date one, if needed, to balance the books. Households at date zero are fully myopic. They see the money today. They don't respond to the tax hike tomorrow. Those are my strong assumptions I'm imposing for now. And output is fully demand determined at date zero, usual Keynesian cross. Then what's output at date zero? Well, I give you the transfer. How much do you spend? The MPC times the transfer. That's how much demand has increased. What's the Keynesian cross amplification? Usually it's one, five minutes. Usually it's one over one minus the MPC, but now I have this tax base channel. So it's one over one minus the MPC times one minus the tax rate because some dollars go to the government. So what's the self-financing share? It's just the output response times tau y because I, in this rigid price model, I only have the tax base channel. Okay, good. Now, what do we see? Number one, this channel is increasing in the MPC, the strength of this self-financing channel, obviously, because the demand boom is bigger. 
And number two, it's one if and only if the MPC is one, right? Because then on the right hand side, the numerator becomes tau i, the denominator becomes one minus one minus tau i, so also tau i, the tau i is cancelled, it's one. Okay, good. So what does that have to do with the environment I just described? Well, the dynamic economy has, a, has precise analogs to the static Keynesian cross in the following sense. Let's begin with what I call partial equilibrium, so prior to prices and quantities adjusting. In that case, the government says, I give you a dollar today, and I tax you a dollar times the accumulated interest H periods from now. How are you as a household going to respond? Well, if you're alive at the beginning, you see the one dollar you get, you think the tax in the far future, someone else will need to pay. Okay. So you see the dollar at the beginning and you spend it and you spend it pretty quickly because you again literally expect to exit the economy at some point. Okay. Conversely, for those people al alive around date H, they see the, the tax hike, so they spend less. So what do you see prior to prices and quantities adjusting is the figure on the, on the next slide. You see this. So what you see here is demand over time, so time on the x-axis uh, um, and the amount of spending on the y-axis. So what do we see? Demand goes up at the beginning by how much? Well, a net present value of $1 because I gave you $1 and you spend it kind of quickly, which is a little bit like our static Keynesian cross economy, an MPC of one. Just now, period zero is the short run. And then what happens in the long run when the tax side comes online? Well, there's a bust, a spending bust of minus $1 in net present value terms because the government isn't creating money out of nothing. It says, I give you a dollar, I take away a dollar in net present value terms. So there's a spending bust later on. If I had Ricardian households, this would just be a line of all zeros because these are infinitely lived guys. With my OLG or Hank households, it's a one at the beginning and a minus one at the end. Okay, good. Now, what happens in general equilibrium? Well, for now, let's suppose output is fully demand determined. So demand has gone up at the beginning. So income has gone up. Whose income? Income of the people alive at the beginning. So when do they spend it? At the beginning. Okay. What happens with this additional output? Well, some of it goes back to them. Tau Y goes back to the government. Okay. So what do you get? Is a general equilibrium multiplier that will bid up to one over the tax rate at the beginning. So that's again the MPC of one in our static Keynesian cross, where again, period zero is not the short run. Everything gets spent in the short run. So you're bidding up to a cumulative multiplier of one over the tax rate. So then what happens in GE in this figure? I increase this initial boom from one to one over the tax rate. So then how much tax revenue have I generated by like date 50 or something? Well, one. So then do I need the tax hike at date H? Well, no, I don't, okay? That was my initial fiscal rule. It said hike taxes if needed. So that's the core intuition. So if you got this, you understand why in our OLG environment it works out and why in a hang type environment you would get exactly the same because MPCs are elevated at the beginning and spending is front loaded because of that addition, uh, um, additional discounting embedded in the consumption function. Those two key features were everything that's driving my results. Okay, good. Now I have like a, what, two minutes left? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So let me, um, let me just give you kind of a very quick overview of what the remainder of the paper is doing. Um, if I can, there you go. So kind of the paper is a discussion of practical relevance in a dual sense. Number one, it kind of extends the theory in multiple directions. And here's just kind of a quick sketch. On the fiscal side, that distortionary taxes and government purchases don't really change much, should be relatively transparent. We can talk about this more later if you're interested. On the monetary side, that's kind of a little bit more interesting. If the monetary authority accommodates, so phi is less than zero, then all of this kind of Keynesian boom stuff happens even more quickly. So the result goes through without change. If the monetary authority leans against the boom, then the boom is delayed. You may still get this self-financing to play out if the monetary authority is not too aggressive. Perhaps the most interesting implication for this audience is that if monetary policy is very, very aggressive, then for a bounded equilibrium to exist, fiscal adjustment actually needs to be quick enough. Usually in the, in the textbook, we just say, as long as fiscal policy is passive, so at some point there's fiscal adjustment, we can forget about the fiscal side. Okay, that's why we just have our usual three equations. Here we're saying if monetary policy is very aggressive, then fiscal adjustment needs to be quick enough. So the requirements of what passive fiscal policy means become higher. Okay, so that is another point we can maybe discuss in the Q&A. And then on the economic environment, I've already clicked, I anticipate it will be slower than this. Uh, main point is, you can in introduce investment, doesn't really change much, or you switch to a full-blown quantitative hang model. I can't prove stuff anymore. I can show it numerically. Okay, 
Final point here is just then in kind of a calibrated quantitative version of our environment. What do we see here? Impulse responses of output and inflation to a one-off fiscal deficit and a different empirically relevant assumptions on the speed of fiscal adjustment, which is now my the tau d policy that we can take from the data, how large tau d is. And what you see on the right-hand side, these three dots are kind of three numbers of how quick fiscal adjustment has been in the data from prior work. You see with those numbers, you get relatively meaningful self-financing shares. So the fiscal boom induced by an initial deficit that's only gradually financed is already large enough to quite meaningfully contribute to its own financing in this environment via the induced output boom and the increase in inflation. Um, okay, out of time, so let me just wrap up with the main thoughts I wanna leave you guys with. So kind of the core theoretical insight of the paper is in kind of an environment that people nowadays very much use to think about fiscal policy and its propagation. If in that environment you have a deficit and you delay adjustment, there are very strong forces to the financing instead coming via price and quantity adjustments along the equilibrium transition path. And that kind of, in our view, has some interesting theoretical and practical implications. Theoretically, it relates somewhat to the, to the FDPL literature, but here it's grounded in a very classical failure of Ricardian equivalence, okay, on the household side. So you don't need to enter into the debates of can the government commit to never adjusting, right, which leads to this discontinuity in the FDPL literature. Here it's just, it smooths things out. As you delay your adjustment, all of these forces are going to be there. But we also very much shine the light on adjustment coming via the output tax base expanding rather than via prices. Final thing in practical terms, self-sustaining, self-financing fiscal stimulus may be at least somewhat less implausible than commonly believed in an environment with the key features I've stressed. So you want to think that monetary authority is not too aggressive, is somewhat accommodating the initial boom, and output is at least harshly or even largely demand determined, so you get things via the tax base going up and not so much via inflation. Sometimes these um, assumptions would be satisfied, sometimes they would not be. Okay, good, that's all I have, thank you. Thank you very much, yeah. Christian, for this very <laughs> interesting presentation. So not only fiscal adjustment was delayed, but also the pointer. <laughs> yes, yes, I should make that joke. Okay, I give now the floor to Davide Bostoni. All right, uh, well, first of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers for giving me the opportunity to be here today and discuss uh, this uh, very interesting and thought-provoking paper. So um, there is a, a long-lasting uh, debate in the fiscal policy literature uh, about uh, how to finance uh, uh, fiscal stimulus, whether it should be self, uh, whether it should be tax financed, debt financed, and this paper explores a third option, the one that we are all hoping for, that is uh, whether it could be self-financed. Um, all right, so it asks uh, two questions. Is it possible in theory and then uh, is it possible in, uh, in practice? And the answer uh, to both questions uh, in this paper is yes. Uh, let me describe, uh, start describing what is the mechanism. So the key idea is uh, to think about uh, a, an environment with two key ingredients. Uh, one is the presence of nominal rigidity. So, uh, that makes uh, demand, uh, ch the demand channel particularly active in stimulating economic activity. And the second channel is uh, the presence uh, of a household with finite lives or uh, liquidity constraints. So the main idea is that uh, if we today stimulate, uh, we provide a fiscal stimulus, but we uh, increase, we finance it with taxes somehow in the future, because of finite lives or liquidity constraints, people will not fully internalize that taxes will increase in the future. And as a result, they don't uh, save uh, some uh, of their income to, to pay for the future tax increase. So this is illustrated in an OLG framework uh, uh, with liquidity constraints, but the same logic would also be correct if we think about environments with you know, some behavioral uh, assumption like uh, uh, bounded rationality, finite uh, or planning horizon, and so on. The logic will be, will be the same. So the key policy implication is that if we push fiscal adjustment uh, farther enough into the future, this will create, uh, because of this uh, myopia or uh, you know, uh, uh, finite uh, lives uh, or liquidity constraints, it will generate a boom in the present. All right, uh, now the second question is, is it plausible in practice? And again, as I said, the answer is yes. 
The authors uh, uh, provide a quantification in a model that is an OLG model, or also in the appendix, they have a, a fully fledged heterogeneous agent new Keynesian model, and where they find that uh, uh, the degree of self financing is substantial. In, uh, it could be substantial in our, in our economy. And of course, uh, this is a very thought provoking result. So uh, let me see if I, well, here, uh, the, my discussion is going to be uh, organized in the following way. So uh, first, I will try to summarize uh, briefly the main mechanism again to provide uh, you know, a context uh, and discuss the, the, the results of this paper in the context of the literature. And then I'm going to raise uh, two main comments. That is, uh, well, uh, I agree that uh, in theory it is uh, possible that we have uh, full self-financing. But uh, I'm going to argue that there could be alternative ways to get self-financing that do not depend on the uh, delay of uh, fiscal adjustments. And the second is uh, that uh, if we take at least literally the result that uh, there is a substantial degree of self-financing in our economies, this opens up potentially some empirical puzzles. And I will try to offer some possible explanation, even though, of course, uh, uh, it's a more of a conjecture than, uh, than a solid result at this stage. Uh, so let me get started by uh, looking a bit at the main mechanism. So uh, let's see if I can do it. Okay, here. So uh, the starting point is a very simple government budget equation that uh, holds true in a, a variety of contexts and that we all know. So the evolution of debt that depends on interest rates and the primary deficit. Here, uh, the key one uh, important element is to realize that uh, what you see on the right hand side with the letter T is the tax revenues can always be thought as the product of two elements. One uh, is the tax base that we call Y and the other is the uh, an implicit tax rate that we call Tau. So you can think, uh, we can always think that as a tax revenues has been uh, com decomposed into these two elements. And uh, then, uh, uh, so let me, on. So if we just uh, play a bit uh, with this, this budget constraint, we take, uh, we fully differentiate the budget constraint and we iterate forward. We impose that debt has to go back to steady state in the, in the, in the long run, at least in the trend of the terms. Then uh, we have a very simple decomposition that, however, is very useful. So on the left hand side, we have the total fiscal stimulus that we plan to implement uh, between today and the future. That is uh, what we need to finance. Then uh, this uh, uh, fiscal stimulus can be financed uh, through three uh, components. The one uh, that is the, uh, uh, the focus of this paper is the first one that is called tax base. Because of this fiscal stimulus, we may stimulate economic activity and as a result, as a self-financing part. But uh, of course, then uh, there is a component that is due to monetary policy that can affect the uh, real interest rate, that is the second term, and the last term that is fiscal policy, that is the fiscal adjustment through adjusting the tax rate. Uh, now, uh, what we are mainly interested in, as I said, is the tax base. Uh, and in fact, this paper shuts completely down, uh, almost completely down monetary policy, assuming that the real interest rate is kept constant, apart from the very initial change in inflation that affects the initial interest rate. So let's focus on the tax base. But then if we focus on the tax base, we clearly see that uh, the share of self-financing is intimately related to the fiscal multiplier. The share of the tax base, the financing share of the tax base over the total is just tau, the tax rate multiplied by the fiscal multiplier or the cumulative fiscal multiplier. All right, so uh, if we want to have a, a full self financing and abstracting from the initial debt erosion, that I don't, I mean, we can define it as part of self financing or not. I prefer not to. I think of, of inflation as a, as a tax. So let's say, let's focus on the tax base. This implies that to get full self-financing, we need a multiplier that is bigger than one over tau. That, of course, is bigger than one. Now, an important aspect uh, to, uh, that, uh, to understand the contribution of the paper is to realize that this multiplier, fiscal multiplier, is not a number that is a constant uh, regardless of uh, economic conditions, regardless of, uh, of a variety uh, of structural features of the economy. But importantly, this fiscal multiplier, and this is the main point of the paper, depends on fiscal policy. So depending on how quickly we adjust the tax rate, the, the last term in the decomposition, 
if we delay fiscal policy to the future, we are getting a higher fiscal multiplier, uh, a cumulative fiscal multiplier. So, well, of course, uh, the, this logic would hold true in any theory that is able to generate a sufficiently high fiscal multiplier. Okay, this is one particular mechanism, but there could be others. So let me briefly summarize some theories where we get a high fiscal multiplier. Well, one is in real business cycle models, as for instance, we see in Baxter and King, we have a multiplier much bigger than one for persistent shocks to investment or public investment, say, or a reduction, well, to distortionary taxes. Well, multipliers, as we know, are larger than one in new Keynesian models. So it's easier to find the multipliers bigger than one in new Keynesian models. This could be true, for instance, even in the baseline three equation new Keynesian model, if we think, uh, for instance, that monetary policy is sufficiently accommodative. If the central bank reduces the real interest rate in response to a fiscal stimulus, then we can get an arbitrarily large fiscal multiplier. Okay, and uh, this is, is a point made by Woodford in 2011 or Cristiano Neikenbaum and Rebello, for instance, in the concept of the zero lower bound when it becomes binding. The real interest rates falls, so therefore multipliers are, are, are much larger. A second uh, strand of the literature is uh, the heterogeneous agent model, where the multiplier could be larger than one because of liquidity constraints or finite lives. That is essentially the point of this paper. That this could be done in uh, papers with two agents, uh, a fully fledged Hank models, uh, as uh, I'm mentioning in these slides. But is, in this paper uh, is about OLG or perpetual youth models, uh, La Blanchard and Yari. And actually, this is also a point that is uh, already made uh, uh, by, I don't know, Ranking and Scalera in an uh, you know, Italian journal, published in an Italian journal uh, in 1995, and more recently in a more empirical and quantitative work by uh, two economists, well, formerly of the Bank of Spain, Basso and, and, and Rakevi. Having said this, this paper has a clear contribution relative to the literature because it not only shows that the multiplier is, can, could be large, but it actually looks at the conditions for full self-financing and it provides a quantitative assessment. So it's a distinct uh, contribution that, and this is why I think this paper uh, um, is important and I encourage you to read. All right, so uh, from a practical point of view, this paper provides support for delaying fiscal adjustments. And one point I wanna make is that, well, uh, fine, but this is not necessary. And uh, for instance, uh, I can, we can think about two examples where uh, self full self-financing, of course, without uh, uh, delaying fiscal adjustments. The first example, and uh, actually I will just focus uh, on one example that is a baseline new Keynesian model where there is a money finance fiscal stimulus. But uh, the same holds true also in a two agents new Keynesian economy where even though there is no f uh, delay in fiscal adjustment or actually it is enough to have a one period as long as the fiscal deficit is not financed immediately, it's delayed by one period, we could already have a full uh, self-financing as long as there is a high enough share of end to mouth households. Again, uh, so let me go to the first example, a money finance fiscal stimulus. So this is a very simple three equation new Keynesian model uh, on the, of a non-policy block. On the policy block, we have the government budget constraint that I shown you earlier, augmented by signorage that is generated by creating money. That is the term in red. And then I have a, a very standard passive fiscal rule. Taxes are adjusted to stabilize debt, but I have a monetary rule where the quantity of money is adjusted precisely to keep debt constant. Okay, so this is an active fiscal rule. It doesn't have anything to do with the fiscal theory of the price level, but is a sufficiently accommodative monetary policy. Okay, that as a result would lower the real interest rate. So this is called the money finance fiscal uh, fiscal uh, uh, stimulus. Then, if you put, you know, if you look at uh, these pictures and you actually focus on the picture on the very on the very right of the slide, you see that uh, even though it is called a money finance fiscal stimulus. These, uh, these policies generate a large increase in the tax base, that is the blue part. And if we look at, at this picture, we see that the share of self-financing self -financing due to the increase in the monetary base is above 50% or you know, uh, 60%. So this uh, a bit calls into questions, uh, you know, it's a bit of a terminology issue. It is called money finance fiscal stimulus because of the accommodation of monetary policy, but actually a large part is self-financed according to the terminology introduced by, by this paper. I, I made, as I said, I can, I, we could make the same example uh, uh, through uh, a, a similar case with a two-agent new Keynesian model, but uh, I will skip it in the interest of time. Uh, 
The second comment is about the empirical relevance. So uh, the paper shows that if we calibrate the model matching the MPCs uh, and then we have a slow uh, fiscal adjustment, the self-financing share could even be 95%. Uh, okay, and that is mostly driven by the tax base. In the inflation erosion is, no, is not very relevant. But then uh, it implies that the model, according to the logic that I've been uh, exposing, that the fiscal multiplier in, in this model must be uh, bigger than one over tau. Tau is set to 0 0.3, 30%. It means a multiplier larger than three. Well, in the room, uh, in the room we have uh, many influential uh, 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 exponents of, of the literature on the, on the fiscal multipliers. Uh, my, my view is that the macro estimates of fiscal multiplier are quite smaller. Uh, according to the survey of Remy, is, they are around one. Of course, there is lots of variation depending on the type of expenditures uh, and a variety of other issues. But still, having a multiplier bigger than the three is, uh, is, uh, is not easy uh, to see in, in reality. So two possible reasons why uh, the multipliers uh, are, uh, are much lower in reality than in the present model. One is... Uh, is it is a bit borrowing the logic from the debt literature or the political economy literature? If we delay uh, fiscal adjustment, this may create a credibility problem of fiscal policies. If you create a credibility problem, we will raise interest rates, and these higher interest rates uh, may actually draw, uh, have a counteracting effect on the fiscal multiplier. Now, the way I like to interpret the result of this paper in this sense is that uh, the paper is providing a rationale for smoothing taxation over time rather than for delaying the fiscal adjustments. If we smooth taxation over time, that is shown to be the optimal policy, typically in this uh, political economy, lack of commitment literature, then uh, this paper shows that there is an additional reason of why we should smooth taxation, that is, we, we may increase uh, increase the fiscal multiplier. I will be reluctant in saying that uh, the best recipe is to delay fiscal adjustment into the future over a certain horizon because of the, it may create credibility problems. The second is, uh, is a, well, why the, well, it's a typical argument related to why the multipliers could be much smaller. In reality is that in this uh, model, the labor market is kept simple for tractability purposes. In reality, for the fiscal multiplier to be uh, op operative in the, in the Keynesian sense, we need slack in the labor market. And uh, arguably, uh, the slack in the labor market, you know, if we don't have enough slack in, slack in the labor market, the multiplier is much smaller than, uh, than, than these numbers that were proposed. And this is, there is evidence, uh, including my own work, but many other papers have pointed this out. So that multiplier is much smaller than one when, uh, when, uh, we have, uh, when we are not, uh, when unemployment is not very high, and that is probably relevant for the current debate. So I will conclude here. Nice and thought-provoking paper shows conditions under which a deficit could be fully, uh, fully self-financed and provides some support for delaying fiscal adjustments. And uh, my comment is that I'm skeptical about the, you know, taking literally at least this, uh, this uh, implication. Uh, it might not be necessary to delay fiscal adjustment to uh, reach high level of self-financing. If we take it literally, it may also have uh, negative consequences. But as I said, perhaps the key takeaway is that smoothing, uh, smoothing the fiscal adjustment over time is uh, it, uh, you know, as, a, as an extra kick uh, in our economies once we take into account uh, these uh, multiplier, multiplier effects. Uh, needless to say, we need more evidence on the effects of delayed fiscal adjustments before we, need, we actually take uh, these uh, recommendations seriously into account. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I, I would now open the floor for 10 minutes uh, questions and uh, remarks so that uh, then uh, you can uh, wrap up at the end and uh, okay yeah. and uh, take everything together okay if, if it's fine with you yeah yeah sure okay so uh, argentina has been trying to do this for the last 10 years and eventually you know uh, because i think it's going to the point what do you think is the the problem in there it's probably what david uh, was saying that the Eventually, you know, the, the credibility destroys the, the the fiscal multiplier, right? Okay, yeah. So to to speak to that, uh, uh, let let me so for a second stick within the confines of the model and how I think I can relate it to that experience. So note, like one of my one of one of the key assumptions in how I was presenting the results is the ability, in my case, via the central bank, to fix or have not increased too much the real cost of borrowing on the government side. Right, that is a crucial throughout maintained assumption that 
that real rate either remains fixed or in my generalization that does not increase too much. Clearly in the case of Argentina, either because just in general borrowing is coming from abroad or because of now outside of the model fiscal credibility related reasons, you may think that real cost of borrowing is going to be going up with the fiscal expansion. And in that case, I think what's actually much more relevant is what I emphasized in my, in my extension at the end of kind of broader monetary fiscal interactions, the converse implication of if I as the monetary authority want to do the if usual thing of following a strict inflation targeting regime, what I need in that kind of environment is a fiscal authority that, I mean, we always say it needs to play along in the sense of balancing the budget, balancing the books down the line. Here in this kind of environment, it needs to be, it needs to happen quick enough. And that's like kind of the core economics of what's going on in these kinds of environments is what you saw in this figure, this separation between the short run and the long run. These binding liquidity constraints, finite lives, whatever they, they induce. And the question is what kind of, what's the economics to come out of this? If you say I can fix the real cost of borrowing, then one of the economics coming out is this multipliers converging to one over the tax rate, abstracting from the price response. If you cannot fix this, then the other thing is you actually need to adjust the deficit quick enough because otherwise you cannot be controlling the demand side via the monetary authority as you would have liked to. Yep. Um, oh, and uh, maybe just maybe just on that on, on that side because then. Um, so if I may kind of connect this to a reply to one of the things in the in the discussion at the end, the the empirical relevance, which very much referred to, as we also do in the paper, to um, empirical evidence that's mostly from the US, where you think and if maybe there, at least for these transitory fiscal expansions that the VR literature looks at, it's actually a relevant assumption to say that the real cost of borrowing is not responding responding that much. Now, if you kind of dig deeper into those fiscal policy VARs, that's actually already what you're seeing. So nominal rates don't tend to respond that much. Inflation also doesn't tend to respond that much. So in that, in that sense, our assumptions there seem to be satisfied. Number two, you kind of also see in those samples, so prices don't respond too much. So maybe you're traveling along a flat Phillips curve. So then what is it? Why are we not seeing those particularly large multipliers? Well, if you kind of look at the actual along the equilibrium transition path in data fiscal adjustments following the spending expansions that say Valerie Ramey has looked at, they are reasonably quickly tax financed. There, there's some differences in how deficit finance things are, like immediately the deficit goes up, but then taxes adjust pretty quickly. Like what we're saying here is you just have it over like 10 years or something, things go down. So kind of one provocative take that I could make on the existing VR literature is that we haven't quite run that experiment yet of having a transitory spending expansion and then not having a fiscal spending, like a, a planned fiscal adjustment within the next five years or so, but delaying a little bit further out. Uh, yeah. Um, to keep with timing, I take another question from uh, Leo, and then maybe you can also yep. wrap up. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I mean, just just a quick follow up. I mean, but let me first say, I think this paper is super interesting because it is so provocative, right? So my, my main question would have been, assume it is right. I mean, that full financing is possible, full self-financing is possible. And the more you delay adjustment, the higher the chances are. I mean, we could essentially forget about the panels this afternoon in a sense, right? So the question is, you know, how robust is this? And I mean, many things have already been addressed. So may, monetary policy, I think, somehow needs to be better understood, maybe even bringing it to the point what is optimal here. But, but more on the technical side, assume you have, because of monetary policy, for example, leaning against something, you have a point where full self-financing full self financing is not any longer possible. Then I think it would be interesting really also to dig, to dig deeper on the fiscal side, for, for example, assume distortionary taxes. And my knowledge of Blanchard-Yari models is, you know, that then you easily can have situations where you lose a single steady state, multiple steady states can emerge, you have Laffer curves, determinacy issues may be at stake. So all these are things I think all these are aspects that could matter then. Just to understand better what needs to be done to to get rid of this result, so to speak. Okay, so just just a couple of quick thoughts in, in reply. So number one, one thing I do want to stress is that, and I try to communicate this in my presentation, that this is a is an entirely positive paper saying in a class of environments that for better or worse recently central banks academics and so on have used to think about the effects of fiscal policy 
there is this kind of time horizon dependence as you're doing, as you're delaying you yourself making the adjustments, something else will be doing the adjustment. And this also then goes back to Davida's point. We refer to like self-financing as this, I guess, somewhat in my view, for purpose of our paper, unfortunate normative connotation of this necessarily being something good. Here it's more something else will give along the equilibrium transition path. This could be quantities responding, and we made clear under the, assu the assumption that which is going to be the case. It could also be prices responding. And you may very well interpret the recent US experience in particular in those lights. If you think there was a large initial fiscal expansion, not a particularly, at least initially aggressive monetary response to it. And the capacity of the economy was such that adjustment then didn't happen, or it only partially happened via quantities, but in a good chunk happened via prices, okay? So you can always get that part, and that would kind of then relate to the FDPL literature saying, we don't need to enter these theoretical debates of, is there infinite delay in fiscal adjustment? If it's already just a little bit delayed, you're already going to get things happening via inflation, which is kind of normatively undesirable if you think that's how the adjustment is going to happen and not, not via quantities, okay? So that, that kind of just on a, on a first part. Uh, second part, distortionary taxation, I kind of briefly got into that. That's not going to change a huge amount at the end of the day. It will somewhat change the split between prices and quantities. Not going to be doing much more than that. We can discuss maybe a little bit more afterwards. The reason I'm actually not particularly deep for, for why that's the case. Um, final thing, I forgot I wanted to reply to one more thing. Uh, sorry, yeah. Blanking on the third part of my reply. I hope that partially got at least to some of the things you had in mind. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. You want to reply to oh, yeah. Uh, so just kind of on the, the kinds of environments that allow for this, and this may be also kind of relating a bit to your question of how we can break things. Like, and there I want to relate to Davides. So Davides said a little bit about what kind of other environments can generate this kind of self-financing as, as, as outcomes. So number one, he mentioned behavioral stuff, myopia at the beginning. There I want to be clear, that is actually not quite sufficient. It gives you half of what we need. It gives you no response at the beginning to the future far delayed tax hike. But remember, I needed two things in my figure. I needed the discounting of the future tax hike, but I also needed the money you get at the beginning to be spent quickly enough in the short run. Behavioral on its own is not quite enough. It only gives you the first one, doesn't give you the second one. And then on the other extensions, well, certainly, yeah, the, the money supply moving that, the seniorage stuff, very much so. What we wanted to communicate is in our kind of environment, even without any monetary accommodation, the strict sense of fixed real rates, there is this kind of time dependence uh, delay in fiscal financing giving you that as interacted by the, with the discounting on the household side. So that's just theoretical distinction. And final point, because I know a bunch of people are working on this class of models. So Davide didn't get to talk about the, the tank stuff, but there is a very important, in this case, a conceptual distinction between what Hank or OLG and tank give you. So in tank, the self-financing and the large multipliers there with a fixed real rate, that can happen if and only if, so for those who are in the literature, um, like spenders and savers are differentially exposed to the fluctuations in income, say because one of them gets dividends payments, the others don't. If you have uniform incidence of everyone, this result doesn't get off the ground in a tank model. Cumulative multipliers are always one for fiscal spending or zero for transfers. You need this kind of Hank or OLG stuff to give you this timing logic that I sketched in my key figure. So that's actually an important, in my view, qualitative difference between Hank type environments and tank environments. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we now move from to uh, another very topical issue. Um, fiscal federalism and monetary unions. I okay, yeah. already introduced you. Yeah. The floor is yours. You mind seeking presenting because from, from home they cannot see uh, you. Uh, that's fine. Right. Yeah, you no see problem. See yeah. From where they yeah. step no. Okay, and the clicker. Yeah, I have a lot of poses. <laughs> okay, uh, so first of all, thanks to the organizers for putting the paper in such a nice conference. So what we do in this paper is um, to ask how should policy choices be delegated between central and fiscal authorities? And related to that, some argued that we should know over which matters several local tribunals are to have jurisdiction and in which authority should be centralized. And as you see, this goes back to Aristotle. So this is to show that this question has been around for a very, very long time, uh, but still we have no subtle answer. Uh, for example, Tabellini argues in the context of the European Union that one of the most pressing 
questions is what tasks should the EU have and which ones should be left to the member states. This answer is also import important uh, for many countries, not just the European Union. Some work has argued that complex rules for fiscal federalism in some Latin American countries are responsible for much of their poor performance in policies. So what are the answers that we have so far in the literature? We have on uh, one branch uh, an answer from a small macro literature on monetary unions that says that centralized authority with fiscal decision-making power is always weakly better. Why is so? Well, the, assu the assumption on this macro literature is that absent any externalities, central and local authorities are equally good. So they can equally uh, uh, tailor the policies in, uh, in these countries. This implies that even if we have only tiny externalities, because centralized fiscal authority internalizes this externality, then the conclusion would be that centralization is better. The idea in this macro literature is that, suppose that we are having a, a country in a union and this country increases its nominal debt, that then uh, it induces the monetary authority to uh, increase inflation so as to reduce the, the real uh, value of such debt. Then if we're thinking of a decentralized fiscal authority, this uh, decentralized authority does not take into account the cost of inflation on others, but a centralized fiscal authority will take into account these uh, externalities, therefore it will spend less, and therefore we will have lower inflation. So basically the main takeaway from this macro literature is that there's no benefit to a decentralized fiscal authority. But on the contrary, we also have a large kind of large micro literature on fiscal federalism. And the answer in that case is that the local authority is better unless fiscal externalities are huge. Why is that? Well, in contrast to the macro literature, the presumption in this literature is that absent externality, local fiscal authorities, decentralized, decentralized fiscal authorities, are much better. So, given that absent externalities, this is the case, we would need substantial externalities before centralization is better. The idea of why local authorities are better is that they are better at tailoring the policies to its local citizens. We can think that they know better the preferences of the citizens so they can tailor these, these fiscal uh, policies better. And this goes back to the seminal work of Oates. So basically, the main takeaway from uh, this literature is that uh, we, would need, uh, we would have large benefits uh, to decentralized authority because of this better knowledge of the tasters. So what's our approach in, in this paper? We want to isolate the circumstances under which centralization is better to this decentralization. And we contrast precisely these two forces. We have the informational benefit of the decentralization in the spirit of this uh, fiscal federalism uh, literature. And we also have the externality benefit of centralization in the spirit of the macro literature. Just to say a few more words about these, these two con contrasting forces, this will lead to a benefit of decentralization in the sense that the central authority uh, can only observe a noisy signal of the local preferences. Now, a natural question given this assumption would be why can the central authority easily elicit its locality uh, tastes just by simple by simple mechanism. The most simple of all would be just asking these local authorities what are the preferences of, of their citizens, right? But uh, here what uh, we, an example that we always put and we like, especially in this, in this time of the year, is that uh, think of uh, giving presents or receiving presents for the holidays. Even if both the giver and the receiver are well-intentioned and care about the welfare of, uh, of everybody, there's evidence, actually, empirical evidence, that there's a value losses in this uh, gift giving, that it's up to 10% of their value in the case of a partner. So we can uh, think of the partner as like a local authority, 
but these losses go up to one third of their value if it's the aunt that is giving you the present. So we can think of this aunt, this analogy, as the central authority that does not know very well the, the preferences of, uh, of, your, of yourself. So that's the, that's the example that we put of why we think that this assumption is, is, is reasonable. So that uh, would be the benefit of decentralization. Now for the benefit of centralization, so that we obtain this trade-off, um, we, we have that the central fiscal authority will internalize the inflationary cost of that. So we will see this in a second. Just a brief overview of, uh, of what uh, we do and an overview of the results. We have a companion paper that uh, deals with a real version of the model. So that just boils down to the initial OATS decentralization theorem, such that absent any externality, local authorities do strictly better. So this gives rise to a cutoff rule that if there are some class of uh, fiscal externalities, central, centralized authorities are better only if and only if the union is sufficiently large. What we do in this paper is we take the, the nominal, uh, sorry, the monetary mon model with nominal debt, as in the macro literature. We obtain a generalized uh, decentralization theorem such that if the monetary authority has commitment, we will see what we mean by that in a second, then local authorities are strictly better. And we also obtain a cut of rule in the sense that if the monetary authority does not have commitment to its policies, then um, centralized authorities are better only if the union is sufficiently large. So this is important that it contrasts with, with the results in, in existing macro literature. And also I want to, to point out that this has important implications if we think, for example, of the enlargement of the European Union, because it's all going to depend on how big the, the, the size of the union is. So let's just jump in uh, the model. So I present this uh, very simple two-period monetary union. I just want to mention that we are currently working on an infinitely uh, uh, version of the time version of the of the model, uh, so that we can get more dynamics uh, of the model. There's going to be i different regions or countries, and they have a representative consumer and a local fiscal authority. Now, there's also a union-wide central fiscal authority that cares about the welfare of the entire union. This is what we can call a fiscal union. And fiscal authorities, either if they are local or central, are in, are in charge of choosing the level of nominal debt. The timing is as follows. In period one, governments finance some government spending with the nominal debt that they choose. And in period two, governments have to repay the real value of their nominal debt, and they have to repay it with distortionary uh, labor taxes. So it's the monetary union, uh, sorry, the monetary authority, the one in charge of uh, choosing inflation. What's the trade-off for the monetary authority? Well, there are going to be some costs of inflation that are reflected in the model as a decreasing productivity with inflation and benefits of inflation. In the case of uh, commitment, these benefits are not uh, are none. In the case of no commitment, we're going to have that exposed inflation erodes the real value of this nominal debt, so that what the governments have to pay, it's less in terms of in, in real terms. This lowers the distortions from from uh, taxation, so that's the benefit of inflation. The firm problem, uh, it's going to be useful to see precisely the inflation cost in the model. So firms in each country have a given amount of money, M, this is exogenous uh, parameter, and they buy inputs, X, with this money. These inputs are going to, use, to be used to enhance productivity. So the firm problem is just uh, uh, to, probably cannot, yeah. Um, well, they have a linear technology in labor, multiplied by this A function of the, of, of the inputs that the firm uses, subject to a sort of a Kaijin advance constraint. So they have to use this money that they have to buy the inputs at a, at a given uh, price. And here it's where we see precisely the cost of inflation, right? Because if there's an increase in inflation, the price of these inputs increases. So given the exogenous amount of money that the and constant amount of money that the firms have, the amount of inputs uh, can be reduced and therefore this affects negatively the productivity. 
So this is the cost of inflation. To see the benefits of um, uh, inflation, it's useful to look at the government budget constraint. There are two periods, so we have two government budget constraints. In period one, the government has to finance this uh, level of um, uh, public goods G, and to finance this amount of, of public uh, uh, good, it uses some uh, claim to BI dollars in period two, to be repaid in period two at a given price one over one plus R. So that's the, the first uh, period government uh, budget constraint is to finance this amount of public debt, sorry, of public good with nominal debt. In period two, it has to repay this debt and it does so by issuing uh, taxes. Uh, so in the second period of uh, government budget constraint, we can see what is the source of benefits to inflation. An increase in inflation reduces the real value of debt, so it reduces the taxes that it has to um, levy to, to pay for this, for this uh, real value of debt. <clears throat> And uh, the consumer's problem uh, to close uh, this economy have um, two ways of saving. They can save using nominal debt uh, from the government, or they can store real assets uh, K with some technology that has a fixed real rate of return. In period one, consumers receive some endowment, consume and save, and get utility from the public goods that the government provides. In period two, they supply labor, to the firms, they consume and they get the returns on their savings and on uh, labor in the form of, of the competitive wages. So basically the consumer problem is what you see in the slide. Uh, in period one, <clears throat> they get utility of consuming and of the, from, the, from the public good. And in period two, two, they get utility from consumption in period two and this utility from supplying labor. Now, an important term in this equation is the theta parameter multiplying the utility over public goods. For simplicity, we assume in, in, the, in this model that this parameter can only take two values. So whether a country has a high preferences for public good or a low preference for public goods. And this is important because this is um, uh, precisely what affects the, 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 the benefit of decentralization. We assume that the local authority perfectly observes the, these preferences of the country. So the local fiscal authority knows theta. However, the central authority observes only the noisy uh, signal over these preferences. This is uh, this S parameter uh, in the slide. With a given informative ne le informativeness level, phi, that ranges between one half and one. Intuitively, if uh, phi is equal to one, then we would have that the signal is perfectly informative. So there would be no difference between the local central authority and the, and the uh, central fiscal authority. But if the phi is equal to one half, then the signal, and here I have to point out a typo in the slide, the signal is not informative at all. So that the expected value of the, of the theta for a given signal is just the, the, the average of the data. Okay, and of course, for general fee, we can use base rule to, to, to compute the expectation over this data. So this goes back to the, to, the, to the interpretation that local knows better about the preferences of their citizens. Just to, well, uh, this is to um, point out the consumer's problem solution. I just want to point out here that we can write the uh, labor supply by the, the equilibrium labor supply by the consumer as a function of taxes or equivalently uh, tax rate or equivalently as a tax revenue of the government and the productivity in the country. Okay, so we have um, uh, now, uh, gone over the agents on this uh, uh, on this economy. Now we are left with the monetary authority. That remember, it's the one setting the inflation um, uh, of the union. First, consider the case that the monetary authority has commitment. This means that in terms of the timing, first the monetary authority sets inflation that is going to prevail in the second period, and the 
it sets such inflation before any informational signal is realized. Then all other agents move, taking this inflation as given. So because it, it has commitment and because of uh, the lack of arbitrage between nominal debt and, um, and real assets that the consumers use to save, that we have the, the, the Fisher equation implies that inflation has no effect on the real return on nominal bonds. So basically, this is saying that in this economy where the monetary authority has commitment, there will be still the cost of inflation because inflation decreases productivity, but there are no benefits of increasing inflation. So the basic result of this uh, simple model is that the optimal inflation rate is then uh, zero because of this cost. And the decentralization theorem immediately applies in that if signals are not perfectly informative, then locals always do better. Therefore, a decentralized regime will yield a higher ex ante welfare than the fiscal union. And the differences in the welfare between central and, and, and a decentralized regime increases as the information problem becomes worse. And this, it's again in contrast with the results in the standard macro literature. But let's jump to the more interesting uh, case that is what happens if the monetary authority does not have commitment. This means in terms of timing that the monetary authority will move in the second period after all the nominal debt decisions and the real savings decisions have been made. So in period one, preferences and signals are, uh, are realized. Consumers and governments choose their spending, their nominal debt and savings. And it's in period two when the monetary authority sees what's the, this vector of nominal debt for each country and this vector of real savings in each country. And then it chooses the inflation based on this state of the economy. Given uh, this inflation, then the government has to choose taxes or labor to pay for the real debt and consumers choose how much labor to, to supply. Now, in contrast to the previous case, here we have cost of inflation are going to be the same. There's this decrease in productivity. But now the benefit of inflation comes from the real value of nominal debt decreasing with inflation, and hence the distortions from uh, taxation on labor will also decrease. Okay, so uh, just to give the intuition of why uh, the model delivers this indirect fiscal externality. <clears throat> Suppose that utility is additively separable, as we have shown before, uh, so that the optimal choice of inflation by the monetary authority only depends on the uh, state that it receives, the nominal debt that it sees that all countries has issued, and the real savings of all the agents in this economy. So basically it means that monetary authority at the start of period two only cares about the utility in period two. It does not care anymore about the preference for public goods of a country being high or being low, because that's already gone in the first period. So the monetary authority will maximize uh, equally weighted sum of the utilities in period two of each country in the union. Uh, and this is going to generate this uh, indirect fiscal externality in a decentralized regime. Because basically the government of country I, when it chooses its uh, amount of nominal debt, only takes into account that by increasing its amount of nominal debt, it's increasing uh, inflation, but the cost of this in inflation increase, it only takes into account its own cost, not the cost in the rest of the economy. So that's precisely the point of the paper and uh, where the externality is coming from. Key to this externality is uh, what the fiscal authority anticipates that the monetary authority will do in the two different types of regime, in the centralized and, the, and in the decentralized. So just for simplicity, we consider here a linear utility function. Then the problem of the monetary authority is just uh, that equation that, that we see in the slide. So it's basically uh, summing uh, over the utility that it's now the production plus the the real uh, savings returns minus the, the, the utility of working. 
So just to simplify matters, we are gonna use this notation that the F is the part that encodes the benefits and cost of inflation for any given level of debt. So basically, if we assume that preferences are perfectly correlated across countries, assumption that we will relax later, then uh, all countries are identical. The central regime chooses a symmetric amount of debt for all countries, and hence the fiscal authority, the central fiscal authority anticipates that the monetary authority uh, optimal choice of inflation is just given by the, this first order condition uh, at the bottom of the slide. And this contrasts with the decentralized regime, again, because the decentralized regime is choosing inflation for country I. It's taking what everybody else is doing as uh, as a symmetric outcome. So they think that everybody else is doing B minus I, then the monetary authority faces an almost symmetric history, and the first order condition changes with respect to, to the one that we see in the centralized case. So just to uh, make this more clear, when fiscal authorities choose its nominal debt, it has to take into account if it increases its nominal debt, how much inflation it's gonna change. So that's why it's useful to, to look at the elasticities. In this case, if uh, the, the, the change in inflation that the central regime anticipates is given by this red formula. However, the decentralized regime only internalizes it, the change in inflation uh, affecting its own country, I. So by this, you can see in the green part, contra contrasting it with the red part, that it only anticipates a change in inflation, that it's a fraction one over I, where I is the number of countries in the union, of what the central fiscal authority takes into account because it internalizes all the, uh, the effects in all the countries. So this is the same, uh, but written in terms of elasticities, the elasticity, the debt elasticity to, of inflation in the decentralized regime, it's a fraction one over I of the debt elasticity to inflation in a central re regime. And this is precisely capturing this um, fiscal, indirect fiscal externality in this model. Okay, let me skip this for the sake of time. And let me just say uh, what we find in this model. So we find that for a class of distortions from inflation embedded in this function, the productivity function A, we obtain a cutoff rule for optimal delegation, such that for any given degree of the informativeness of uh, the preferences of, of the countries, either there exists a finite cutoff in the number of countries, I of E, such that a fiscal union is preferred if the number of countries in the union is bigger than this cutoff, or we can uh, also end up in a result in which a decentralized regime is preferred for all I. This would be the case if the, if the information problem is bad enough. So we have uh, here three cases. On the left uh, panel, we have that, so this is plotting, sorry, the ex ante welfare uh, under a centralized regime, the solid line, and decentralized regime, the dashed line, as a function of the number of countries in the union. The centralized ex ante welfare, it's constant because as we've seen, the inflation uh, change with, uh, with debt does not change with the number of countries, but the externality problem gets worse as the number of countries increases, right? So because each country internalizes like a smaller part of the, of the effect uh, of inflation. So in the, in the left panel, we have that the centralized regime is basically always prefer unless the, the, the absurd case that the monetary union comprises only one country. In the middle, in the middle panel, we have that the decentralized is always prefer to a centralized regime. And in the uh, right panel, it's like the most interesting case that uh, we find a cut of, it, of the number of countries such that if the union is small enough, then this externality problem is not such a big issue. And because of the informational benefits of local authorities, a decentralized regime would be preferred. But if the union is big enough, then the externality problem becomes bigger and a decentralized regime uh, would be preferred. Moreover, we find also uh, that the cutoff will decrease as uh, it is intuitive with the informativeness of the signal. So I think I conclude or 
yeah, you have you to... I mean, I just to point out that I've shown you the case with perfectly correlated preferences, meaning that all the members of the union have the same preferences. This is obviously um, uh, not the best case. So we also play with what happens with independent preferences. Uh, algebra becomes a bit more complicated because you have then to take into account the combinatorics of all possibilities in the union, but the results still hold with more difficult um, algebra. Uh, so we obtain the cutoff rules such that the, mon the centralized um, authority is better for a large enough uh, union. And I think I, sorry, I will uh, conclude now. So we have shown uh, how insights from the fiscal federalism literature uh, changes the principle of delegation from the existing macro literature in that optimal delegation does not just depend on whether externalities exist or not, but there's this trade-off between externalities, fiscal externalities, and the natural advantage of local authorities. Um, so there's this no one size fits all rule applies to delegation. It's important to point out that this has implications for the design of a monetary union and for the analysis of enlargement policies. So, yeah, I'll conclude here. Thank you. Thank you, Eugenia, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, I give now the floor to Ramon. Ramon, you arrived a bit later, so I remind you that you have 15 minutes at disposal. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me, and thanks for having the chance to discuss this paper, which I think is very timing for the topic of the conference. Do I need... Yes, sorry. It's a bit delayed. So there are basically two dimensions to fiscal federalism, which of course are not orthogonal. One is the subsidiarity principle, which is a, a basic principle, for example, in the design of the European Union. And the other is the, this problem of federal internal externalities, which is a fact. So the question is, I think it, before I was going to tell my students that was my who should fix my bicycle, now it changed to who should fix my battery. And in the old times, that's what it was. You, you got your cables and that's it. And when I first arrived to Chicago in the cold days, people were taking the battery back at home at night. Now things have changed. At one point, I was doing this thing and made a small mistake with the car of my wife, and it was very expensive. So then I decided to move to have the local mechanics doing it. That's a good mechanism because there is some competition, and also some friendship. But things are getting differently now. So I have this problem with a new car. And I took it to the local mechanic, and maybe he did a mistake. I had to go to the central Honda in Florence, which is not very close to home. And it turns out it's taken care of by the central Honda, I don't know, Japan or something, but uh, so here where we are. This problem is that uh, how we're going to say always as economists that uh, who should do it is who is more efficient. But as I said, technologies change and that answer can be different in different solutions. The focus has been in the literature uh, that Henny was pointing out, particularly on fiscal federalism, uh, about uh, this idea that Locals know better. Actually, it should be 72, not 99. And there is another side of it, which is to say, well, better commitment, and this is a long literature, and about thinking, for example, the European Union, that um, local monetary policies were not so much consistent, and instead, here, the ECB is much more time consistent, and therefore, that's how it goes. But here, then, you then have this so-called problem of internal external externalities, which is simply the fact that if you have a joint good with some characteristics of public good, the free rider problem becomes worse and worse as you get larger. So those things are well understood. So here's like, I will call it, two folk theorems. One is this generalized decentralized theorem, which says under subsidiarity principle, 
you got the best thing is uh, decentralization. They call it generalized because in odd times, the idea was that the centralized policies always have to be uniform. And they do a little better than that. And they say, no, you can even have target, but maybe they are not well target. And so that's the theorem, no? If the locals are better informed on citizens' needs and aspirations, fiscal policies will be run by local governments and the welfare gains will be larger, the more inform the relative information they have is better, okay? And here, the key element of the proof of that is just this thing, playing with inf how informative the signal is, and that will give you everything. The second theorem is that is the free rider law large numbers theorem, which is a perversive theorem, which says as the number of locals increase, the free rider problems aggravates. And here, the key proof of, the, uh, of this theorem is about elasticities, showing that uh, the elasticity of the local axis in respect to the center becomes more and more inelastic. So there is a corollary, of course, of these two, is that then if you have two things coming, then if they coexist, then should be some place or another a cutoff point on the level of municipalities, maybe two. So this is what the paper makes the point. It was based on the first part, which now seems to be another paper, uh, is more of a real economy. Then without externality, theorem one applies. And with the fiscal externality, theorem two and the corollary apply. And there is a little peculiar externality because you like the goods of everyone, okay, that uh, of all the other municipalities or countries or whatever. So as more countries they have, the better you are. Well, I am in Florence in the center, in the Florence of Barcelona. Sometimes now it seems the other way around, but anyway, they make the point. And the, the interesting thing is that then this point is helpful to have the model, which is the monetary model, which is, I think is the contribution, uh, where we just have seen. Uh, it's clear if you, and what you have seen now, is you, you have this timing uh, from the perspective if you're a local government and you have here the pie in red, you are clearly on one match of the pie for the consumer side. And certainly if you look at the expenditures that the G and you look at the, the nominal rate between the real and the inflation, at the end of the story, by raising inflation, you don't gain anything from that perspective. And that's true if it is a single local government. It's also true if it is the whole central. So it's all about timing, commitment, and externalities, and which we have seen. So inflation cannot be below one. Uh, so therefore, that question is, if it's decided first before all the decisions, and it's not change, so which means you have full commitment, it's obvious that pi is equal to one. Either you are decentralized or decentralized. And then, of course, if there is a problem of information, theorem one applies. However, if we reverse the timing, then, and pi is decided after all the decisions are made about savings and levels of debt, then they are very close to being in a situation of limited commitment. And then we have the externality. And, and as we have seen exactly, the proof relies on this fact that if I look at the elasticities of what? Of how much I increase the debt over respect to the inflation. And you would think about the symmetric case, but it generalizes to the non symmetric case. Then when you are decentralized, okay is one over i, the elasticity of the central. So as simple as that. As i goes to infinity, this elasticity just goes down to zero. So then you have theorem two and the corollary. And of course, in general, you're gonna have that the welfare is worse under decentralization. So the question is, who is the center here? Well, maybe not. So 
we, we want democracy, but uh, then there is a problem with democracy, which is that problem can be even more perverse when we have a strategic delegation. So if I can change slightly the model here and put that uh, now that you work in period one, and then in period two, there is some uncertainty. And to make it simpler, so we have different states and every, so there is a bad state only to one of the countries or locals, okay, at the time. So then we're gonna have a version of this where it's a theorem two and the corollary then. Why? Because there is a world of imperfect uh, resharing if you have in this model, if you were on your own, then you will use inflation exactly to adapt to this shock. But when you are in the union, you're not gonna do that. But most of the time and for everyone is not having anything. So you should put it at zero, but well at one, pi at one, basically. But insist, you will insist to the one period that this affects you. And therefore what will happen who will you delegate to this central bank with representatives? You delegate the guy who takes the bacon home, the most radical of possible guy, even if we are all moderate. So we have an, an obscure and representative paper with Charin Jones, and it's obscure because I realize it only has one uh, citation, and that means it's representative because most of the papers they get none or almost one. So. Uh, but I think the first one has more, 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 more to do. So what have been the solutions to that? Okay, by the way, this thing of bringing the bacon home it comes from the fact that workers had this possibility to take some bacon from free, and that was important. So you will take the guy with the larger hand there to get it. So how is it solved in, in US, for example? Was he gonna send the guy who is the to the Congress who wants to take more stuff home, but then to counterbalance this, maybe someone in the central government that would order. That was in the previous century. Now the US is, who knows, beyond our theorems, okay? But, and then, and then of course, then you also have other things, okay? They realize that they have to have budget constraints at the local level or no bailout and so on. In monetary unions, yes, as we have central bank independence with price stability mandate. On the fiscal side, we're gonna have then and now fiscal compact and uh, st stability and growth packs, which seems to go back to us with proposing uniform policies, okay? So, the question is, uh, is you locals getting larger? Well, yes, we had the Granada Declaration, we're gonna to go to 35, okay? So we're gonna have more members and we are moving fast. But beyond the number of members, there are other ways that we are getting larger. Why? Because now we're gonna have, and we have some populists that formerly were all the skeptics, but now they appoint themselves or they appoint them to bring the, home the bacon. The other day, uh, Meloni said, ah, this guy, Draghi, well, they, they took pictures with Macron and all these guys, but he did nothing for Italy. Okay. Uh, and then, but also at the local level, we might have more nationalistic policies or claims, which are along the same lines. So we can think of our European Parliament of 60 official languages. We want to have Catalan and, and Basque and Galician soon. And I don't think it's a problem. If we could have artificial intelligence, it only requires 3,600 pairwise simultaneous translations. But it's a problem if then we have this question of strategic delegating the most nationalistic guys to bring the bacon home. Furthermore, the list of public goods is getting larger. And they have this issue like, who should solve the problem of my car. You're getting those, most of the problems, you can do very little locally. And actually coming here, I realized how fast Europe is expanding from home, Florence, I live in Florence and Barcelona, to here, 
it has taken me 23 hours. Not with my car, which I don't have it, but with Lufthansa. Amazing. I mean, before it was much shorter, much smaller. I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, so can you be do better? Well, I think we do. We can. We are not just a two period uh, you, neither the central bank is. So I think we should have an European stability fund uh, where we can have also long term state contingent country specific fiscal contracts, which are specific to the countries. It will allow that you don't have permanent transfers. They can provide, it's a way to get resharing and proper counter cyclical fiscal policies. And you don't need to interfere much with the uh, debt markets. And so um, that's too much self-referential, but those are papers that explain about these things. So the other was talking about these things here. But the issue is that you might have some need of independence because I think it's a good idea that we expand and maybe the commission becomes an executive uh, committee or whatever. But you need to have some independence before the same way that you needed to put the power from more political interference, interferences. So, just remember, however, that the center may have its own problems. So I'm gonna get the car until next year, I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So, is now open maybe uh, I can't resist asking a question myself uh, I, I wonder following up on what you were just saying how this uh, conceptual scheme and your model uh, could be adjusted to reflect uh, a fiscal design in a monetary union going a bit in the direction uh, of uh, you know next generation EU where you have neither a decentralized nor a centralized fiscal regime, but rather a different type of interaction um, between the central and the local authorities, whereby uh, the central authority, uh, you know, decides on the funding strategy and the prioritization of the public goods to be to be attained. In this case, for instance, the green digital transition or uh, um, social and economic resilience, um, whereas the local authorities keep the ability to exploit the natural advantage of uh, um, being better able to adapt policies uh, and uh, to local characteristics and, and preferences. So under this scheme, basically the, the magnitude of uh, the fiscal externalities across countries and the quality of the information, the central and the local level about uh, the citizens' uh, preferences do not determine a threshold between decentralized and centralized regimes, but rather uh, an optimal trade-off, you know, between uh, central and local decisions while keeping a fundamental continuity among them. Uh, yeah, then uh, do you prefer to, yeah, how do you prefer? I think an answer after, no? I mean, as, you, as you like, okay, right. then we, it, I see Leo. I mean, just a quick comment, you know, on uh, what is meant here by decentralized and centralized. Uh, maybe, you know, the contrast is, 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 comes out here as being too stark. In the Charhikiyo model, to the extent I remember it, and this is close to what you do, all that is needed to address the externalities is to have agreement on a fiscal rule which restrains borrowing behavior. If you design this in a clever way, the externality is gone. So there's no need to go for a full-fledged fiscal union or something like this. Below this rule, countries are free to choose instruments, taxes, spending, as long as this particular rule is, is, uh, is respected. So. Um, yes, so this is um, another variation on um, Ramon Marimon's who is, who is the center comment. Um, so, so the model assumes that the central authority uh, maximizes the welfare of citizens of the union, therefore internalizes externalities. But if I look at how decisions are made at the EU, 
uh, they're usually made by majority rule or qualified majority or unanimity sometimes. So I'd like in this literature to see some kind of analysis of how these voting arrangements or actual decision-making arrangements at the EU map into this idea of internalizing externalities. I'm not sure that in fact ex externalities are internalized uh, to a sufficient extent with the, the setup we have now. Okay, so going back, um, going back to your question, um, we started actually thinking of an economy in which uh, there are two types of public goods. So you can think of parks and uh, tanks, no kind of goods. And uh, some economies, uh, some countries prefer to to spend more on one, and some countries in others. So I think I was thinking of this related to your question because I think one possible way to address what you were referring to is to have like this. Two kinds of public goods in which in one it is very important the information uh, about the local preferences and in the other one maybe the central authority has a better management of it so i think that's a way that uh, we can address this issue um and, and, and i presume that a similar like kind of uh, results in terms of this cut of result would apply maybe with more like uh, yeah non non-linearities in the in the in type of cutoff um and then, um, ah, related to the fiscal rule in Chariquijo, I completely agree. So if if you put like some fiscal rule, for example, in the level on the a cap on the level of of the nominal debt, uh, you can uh, address these um, these distortions from from the externalities. But now the question would be that in order to set, I, I guess, in order to set this uh, fiscal rule the central authority should know something about the preferences of the countries again so we still have this informational problem so so how high this uh, cap is to be it's still like a, a question that would uh, create some distortion between the central and the local authority and regarding the the last question that uh, yeah i think it's 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 very interesting like uh, to have like this uh, voting arrangement the one way that we could deal with this is that so far we assume like some uh, uh, monetary authority or the uh, sorry the central fiscal authority having equal weights across across countries. Uh, maybe we can play around with these weights such that we can um, deal with some sort of, of of voting decisions. Who has more power, for example, in the EU or, or things like that. And uh, yeah, related to to Ramon's discussion, um, I find very in interesting the this strategic uh, delegation issue. Um, it's something that we have to explore more. Um, but uh, so this paper, for sure, it extracts from all the wish sharing issues. Actually, for simplicity, we just assume that all the countries are the same in all the ways. Of course, there are no shocks, so we abstract uh, completely from this. With very large resharing literature, um, uh, and related to what uh, how the EU is changing and whether it's getting bigger or not, uh, something that we are working on is um, again we are assuming this equally weighted um, uh, kind of uh, preferences for the for the uh, authorities, but of course uh, even if we have this equally weighted um, assumption. It depends a lot on the size of the countries and in particular the uh, how fast they are growing for the countries that are getting uh, into the European Union. No? So usually the countries that are um, uh, being added to the European Union are probably more fast growing. So this implies that there's going to be a faster uh, increase in nominal debt because they need to, to these resources to grow. And these can create even more distortion. So these are things that we can take into consideration, and, and uh, we are planning, we're planning to do. Uh, yeah, and I think I'm not forgetting anything 